love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Very good morning to you. As I speak, ministers are walking into Downing Street for a cabinet meeting. A cabinet meeting where no doubt top of the agenda will be the migrant crisis in the channel. The Home Secretary came out swinging yesterday, last night, in the House of Commons, describing what was going on as an invasion. To her detractors, it was incredibly off colour. To her supporters, it was accurate and true. We'll be getting to the bottom of exactly what's going on, how it might be described and indeed how it may be tackled today here on The Briefing. Well, a very good morning. 9.31. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. The UK is being warned that household budgets could be further squeezed with tax rises expected for years to come. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor are under pressure to balance the books with up to £50 billion needed to fill a black hole in the public's finances. The Daily Telegraph says a combination of 50% tax rises and 50% spending cuts is being considered. A Treasury source told the paper it's going to be rough and everyone will need to contribute to maintain public services. Well, meanwhile, there'll be some additional support for people struggling with their energy bills, with National Grid announcing it's launched a £50 million fund to help them over the next two winters. The money will go to charities that offer emergency financial support to households who use prepaid meters, as well as advice on payments and debt. Well, that energy support comes as BP announces profits that more than doubled in the last quarter. Profits surged to £7.1 billion, compared with £2.9 billion a year earlier. The oil giant also confirmed it will be hit by a windfall tax on its UK operations, which it will pay this year. Fireworks were thrown at cars last night in scenes that the leader of Dundee City Council has described as absolutely disgusting. <laughs> Video was posted on social media showing young people lighting fires on roads, blocking cars and forcing them to drive over grass verges. There were also reports of bricks being thrown at vehicles and images showed police in riot gear. Well, Councillor John Alexander likened the behaviour to those in a war-torn nation and said it reflected poorly on the Curtin community. Farmers are warning that turkey supplies could be affected this Christmas following the UK's biggest outbreak of bird flu. They say the current situation is unbelievably bad, describing it as the foot and mouth of the poultry industry. Bird keepers in England will be required to house their birds indoors from the 7th of November to help tackle the spread of the virus. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. It's GB News. Now let's head back to the briefing with Tom. Good morning, it's 9.34 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. 
Now, today, the Cabinet is meeting in Downing Street. Indeed, this morning, ministers have been walking in that famous black door. You can see the pictures uh, next to me now for those watching on television. We have seen already a few Cabinet ministers walk in through that door. If we see any more, if any action goes on in that street, you will be the first to know. But getting on to our top story today, the migrant crisis in the Channel, and the Home Secretary's response to it is dominating Westminster today. Speaking in the Commons last night, Home Secretary Suella Braverman came out fighting, facing down her critics, doubling down on her assertion that the UK is facing an invasion of small boats, and particularly highlighting the issue of Albanian criminal gangs. This year has seen a surge in the number of Albanian arrivals, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of them, I'm afraid to say, abusing our modern slavery laws. We are working to ensure Albanian cases are processed and individuals are removed as swiftly as possible, sometimes within days. The Rwanda partnership will further disrupt the business model of the smuggling gangs and deter migrants from putting their lives at risk. I am committing, I'm committed to making that partnership work. Now, those gangs are on the rise in the UK and shipping hundreds of millions of pounds in criminal proceeds back their, to their home country every year. Official sources have told GB News that much of the surge in Albanians arriving in the English Channel on small boats is being orchestrated by those very same gangs. And let's not forget, Albania is a safe country. Many Albanian migrants are being exploited to manage cannabis farms across the UK, as Albanian criminals have now taken control of most of the country's cannabis trade, which had been previously dominated by Vietnamese gangs. Our Home and Security Editor, Mark White, has this exclusive report. Albanian gangs are the dominant force in organised crime across the UK. We've been told that Albanian crime groups are shipping hundreds of millions of pounds in criminal proceeds back to Albania every year. A number of different businesses, like car washes and barber shops, are often used to launder the proceeds of crime. But in truth, the vast majority of the money they make from their criminal endeavours is simply carried back to Albania by hand or in vehicles. Recently, border officials seized £300,000 bound for Albania in luggage at a UK airport. In another incident, a half a million pounds was found hidden inside a van at a UK port. Albanian crime gangs now control the majority of cannabis farms across the UK. They've taken over much of the cannabis cultivation trade from Vietnamese crime groups, with most of the Albanian cannabis farms concentrated in the north. But in pretty much every part of the country, you'll find Albanians are the dominant group involved in cannabis cultivation, as we found out recently in Suffolk. Is this what you're seeing time and again increasingly now, like, like other forces, that the Albanian organised criminal gangs are moving into yeah, these areas? No, they are. They, they certainly seem to be on the up. Um, they seem the, the dominant ones at the moment. The trade in cannabis is largely self-contained amongst Albanian criminals here, with less control from crime bosses in their home country. In the south, they still control most of the cocaine trade, which is largely overseen by crime lords back in Albania. Across the UK, there has been a number of recent arrests of Albanians suspected of involvement in cross-channel people smuggling. Much of the surge in Albanians arriving by small boats lately is, we are told, being orchestrated by Albanian criminal gangs who want those people to work for them. Most of the people smuggling trade is still being controlled by Kurdish criminal gangs, but they are increasingly working in tandem with Albanian crime groups who are advertising and arranging for people from the Western Balkan nation to head for northwest France before handing them over to the Kurdish gangmasters. Social media is a massive tool the Albanians have been using to good effect to attract their fellow countrymen and women. We've learned that the National Crime Agency has persuaded social media companies to remove 1,700 such videos in recent months. 
but for everyone they delete, many more pop up, persuading Albanians to cross the channel and enter the UK's illegal economy. Mark White reporting for us there. Well, let's cross live now to Downing Street, where our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, has the latest ahead of Cabinet. And Darren, I know you've been watching some of those ministers walk in that famous shining black door this morning. No doubt, top of the agenda today will be this migrant crisis. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure though that is actually going to dominate, I would have thought, Cabinet, but I, I suspect it will be there. Yes, I am in Downing Street getting... Uh, a bit soaked, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, the cabinet is now underway, though. Uh, Dominic Raab, we talked about this last week, we talked about people's timekeeping. It's due to start at 9.30. He's the last minister, I think, in. He went in a couple of minutes ago, so not clearly uh, on time. A bit like days ago, aren't they, mm. about uh, attending cabinet on time. Yes, there is a big row, I would say, not necessarily within cabinet, but certainly outside, about Suella Braverman's statement in the Commons yesterday on two fronts. First of all, this use of the word invasion. Now, for many of her supporters, as you said at the top of the programme, this is an accurate description of what they would say is happening on the south coast of England. We heard Nigel Farage, for example, one of our presenters, say that uh, last night. Uh, there are many others who feel that it is entirely appropriate to use such uh, strong language. Uh, for others, though, they feel that it is incendiary, they feel it is unnecessary and too provocative. Uh, William Hague, the former leader, saying this morning, saying he wouldn't use the word invasion. That is what Russia has done to Ukraine. The word means something specific, though he does go on to say it is an enormous problem. Interestingly, Robert Jendrick, who is the immigration uh, minister, uh, said he wouldn't use that word as well, but did defend the Home Secretary uh, today. So, in many ways, this is a row we <laughs> must not forget, a row the Home Secretary would want. Uh, she wants to appear tough on immigration. She wants uh, to be very clear that she's not going to kind of pussyfoot around when it comes to the language around immigration. And she will be very happy, I would have thought, that this row is happening uh, today. Uh, just in addition, though, of course, there is this other uh, suggestion. We heard it out briefed yesterday um, from some journalists that there were six unnamed sources inside the Home Office who'd suggested that the Home Secretary had refused to book hotels, leading uh, to part of the crisis that we saw in those processing centres in Kent over the weekend, uh, Tom. Now, this is something, of course, the Home Secretary strenuously denied repeatedly yesterday in the Commons. Uh, you've got a battle, essentially, between six unnamed sources telling journalists uh, that she didn't do that. She says she did. Whether it's the truth lie, well, at the moment, frankly, unless those sources come forward, uh, you are going to have to take the Home Secretary for her word. Though, given she said it in Parliament, I, I think if she was ever to be proven wrong, that would be another resignation issue. But it is a reminder, I think, that this is a very, very big problem for the government. It is not a problem that's going to go away. It has got significantly worse in recent years. And frankly, even though Suella Braverman tried to distance herself from her predecessors yesterday quite a lot, if you were pretty Patel, you must have been pretty angry watching the TV yesterday afternoon. It is something that has dogged successive uh, Conservative administrations. And there is no silver bullet to this. And it is entirely possible that we'll be here in a year or two years' time saying this problem is far from sorted. Now, just finally, we're also expecting Cabinet to discuss some of the financial matters today. There are reports that uh, the, there, were, uh, there was a meeting between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor yesterday agreeing on yet more tax rises, rising that tax burden that this country faces further still. Uh, can we expect the fiscal statement now due in two weeks' time to be really quite austere? Yeah, so I think we're looking at a whole range, uh, essentially, of kind of economic mechanisms to try and deal with this apparently, what, £50 billion black hole that are in the public uh, finances, largely, partly caused at least uh, by some of the actions taken by Liz Truss and Quasi Quarten. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of dealing with uh, that black hole? Well, potentially, we believe 104 different uh, cuts mm. to public spending. Uh, we know health is going to be protected, but other areas of the government could be slimmed down even further. It's why Labour are accusing the government of austerity 2.0. But yes, we could also be looking, as we reported this morning, at further tax rises across the board. Now, almost certainly, I think we'll see an extension to the windfall tax that's been imposed on energy companies. BP4 again uh, this morning reporting record profits uh, in the period between June and September. So I suspect that will be extended. We know that there's not going to be any changes 
uh, to uh, things like the income tax thresholds that will suck in a lot more people when it comes uh, to tax income. And we know corporation tax is going to rise, but there could even be further rises, I think, Tom, as well when it comes to tax in the years uh, to come. And that could be quite difficult because there are lots of economists mm. at the moment who are also very concerned that in order to try and plug that hole and to settle the markets, the government might go too far too far fundamentally and actually dip us further into a deeper recession. Really, really interesting stuff there. And also interesting that seemingly every single cabinet meeting, one minister turns up late. Today it was Dominic Raab. Last week it was Tom Tugendhat. And the week before it was Kemi Badenoch. But I, I wonder who it will be next week. This is becoming a tradition. Darren, thank you for <laughs> bringing us the latest there from Downing Street. Well, of course, let's uh, get some more on all of this now, on all of the challenges facing the government, uh, with one Andrew Bridgen MP, of course, the Conservative Member of Parliament for North West Leicestershire. And Andrew, I know that you care deeply about the Channel Crossing crisis and dealing with that crisis. How do you assess the Home Secretary did last night in, in coming out fighting, really? and particularly in the language that she used? Um, this, the channel crossings, the migrant crossings of the channel illegally, um, it's a totemic issue uh, in my constituency and across the country. Um, I think Suella Braverman is the best chance we've got of, uh, of, of, of halting this. And she's getting a lot of pushback from the left because they know that she's serious about, about dealing, dealing with it. And quite honestly, if, if the Conservative government can't come up with a solution in the next 18 months, I think it's going to be very difficult for us at the next general election. Indeed, we've got local elections next May, uh, which is going to be uh, you know, pretty pivotal, really. Yes, it certainly yes. will be. Of course, this Conservative government has been in one form or another in power for 12 years now, albeit without a majority for much of that time, more than half of that time without a majority, but still in power nonetheless. And these numbers coming across the channel have only grown. 40,000 this year, almost double the number that came last year, which in and of itself was almost double the number that came the year before. Why is it that Conservative governments have not been able to grip this issue? Well, the, the numbers are, are, are growing. We promised the public uh, after the Brexit referendum we'd take back control of our borders. And the, the biggest you know, sign that we haven't taken control of our borders is this illegal migration of economic migrants coming from now mostly from uh, young men coming from Albania. Um, Albania is a country that's in NATO. It's, it's applying to join the European Union. It's a safe country. Uh, there is no excuse for them to illegally enter the country. And Quite honestly, if Suella Braverman wants to bring forward a bill which says that anybody who enters the country illegally from a, from a safe third country will be immediately uh, deported, um, I'll be voting for it. And I think a lot of my colleagues uh, will as well. We, we're getting to, to that point. Um, the fact that it's Albanians and they're heavily linked into organised crime, they've been probably running the mafia in London for the last three decades and they're, they're moving their sphere of influence further north is deeply worrying. I think we're you know, using the word invasion. Well, I mean, William the Conqueror, as his forces, he came over in 1066, was considerably less than the number of migrants we've taken in the last 12 months. I think uh, that's what the perception is by the public. And it's, it's really, as Tom, a time for, for plain speaking now. And, and government and the cabinet have got to understand how totemic this is for most of the British electorate. They're, they're working hard, they're paying a lot of tax, and they don't want to see it being spent on keeping people in hotels who've come here, uh, OK, for a better life. But if we're going to let everyone in who wants a better life, it's going to be standing room only in this country. And the only time they're ever going to stop coming, Tom, is when the situation in this country is worse than the country they're leaving. That's not acceptable to my constituents, it's not acceptable to me, and it's not acceptable to my colleagues. That's fascinating that you use that analogy comparing to the Norman conquest there. Um, of course, one of your, other of your colleagues, uh, Mark Jenkinson, has been tweeting the dictionary definition of, of invasions this morning. Sorry, say again. 
Yeah, one of your colleagues, Mark Jenkinson, has been tweeting the dictionary definition of invasions this morning, really seeming to double down on the Home Secretary's language as well. Interesting um, push there, I suppose, from uh, your side of the party. I do want to um, not do this entire interview, however, on the boats crisis, because I believe you are exercised by how you were quoted, or, or, or I must say misquoted, perhaps, in the, in the Times just yesterday. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, there was a, a debate on vaccine harms by public petition last Monday afternoon in, in Westminster Hall, and I, I took part in that, uh, raising concerns about some of the things we've been told about the vaccines, the fact that the vaccines have never been allowed to be scientifically challenged, and that's the way science works. You know, people put thought forward a, a, a theory, and it, that's challenged and rebutted. Um, and I, I asked a question, uh, which in full was effectively that unlike any other vaccine, the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine was given to people who were provably had natural immunity because they'd actually been confirmed of having had the virus. Um, that was then misquoted from provably to probably uh, in the Times. Uh, I'm sure it was an accident. And of course, they missed the first line off about unlike any other vaccine. Um, so um, there's a complaint gone into Ipso, a complaint to the uh, editor of the Times, um, they immediately did a correction of the word, because obviously it was in Hansard, they'd, they'd misquoted me, and they claimed it was a typo. But uh, we're seeing far too much of, of, of this, and that won't do anything to damp down the conspiracy theories. Well, Andrew, always a pleasure having you on the programme. Thank you very much for coming on and uh, putting your case as always. Appreciate it. Uh, now, moving on, Thanks. finally, last night, Russia continued its sustained attacks on Ukraine, targeting critical infrastructure. Now, Kiev's mayor, Vitaly Kli Klitschenko, said yesterday, uh, said yesterday that 40% of the city's residents had been left without water, while 270,000 homes had no electricity. I'm joined now live from Kiev by Petro Poroshenko, the former president of Ukraine, who led the country through the first phase of the Donbass war, of course. Thank you so much for making the time for us this morning. I, I, I suppose, firstly, the winter is going to make this war very, very difficult. Clearly, there have been big advances uh, from Ukraine, pushing the Russians back in the last few months. But uh, what's being done to prepare for the trickier weather, uh, where advances will be much harder? First of all, the war is never an easy thing. And uh, the fact that we have eight years of war, during which we create the armed forces, we make a reform, and we create a global coalition in support of Ukraine, this is the great achievement. Second, this is the Putin who wanted to weaponize the uh, winter, to weaponize the energy question, to weaponize starvation and food, to weaponize nuclear danger. And with that situation, the way for the Putin blackmail you should give a right answer. Today, there was the first night when the temperature was below zero. Today, we have uh, almost 40% of the destroyed infra energy infrastructure in Ukraine. Today, me, my family, and almost most of the Kievites stayed during the night and during the half of the day without electricity, without the water. And this is the way how Putin want to blackmail us, want to create a panic. But on contrary, this is the, as we said, better live in darkness and cold weather than to uh, lost a freedom, lost a democracy. And this is the Ukraine now is a unique country who pay such a high price for the freedom and for the democracy. And we are very much appreciated for the great solidarity we have also from the British people. This is their real friend, friend in need is a friend indeed. And this is difficult. This is the cold in the flats and the residents. This is the not functioning the economy without electricity. But with a very record short time, we renew the energy supply, including because of the uh, supply and transformator generator, 
also from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. We are very much appreciate creating the weapons Rammstein as a first sign of the anti-Putin coalition. But it is extremely important to create energy Rammstein, or maybe not Rammstein, but Birmingham or Manchester, uh, if Great Britain would initiate that. And that would be a cap for the maximum price for the oil and gas, Russian oil and gas. Yes, it, it does seem that yeah. the Western coalition, to some extent, has been pushing Russia further than, than people would have thought in, 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 in some areas. But still in other areas, there is clearly more that the West could do. Uh, in your view, do some countries need to do more? And to what extent does that support need to come, whether it's uh, cutting down on Russian imports or supporting Ukraine with further exports? Everybody should understand. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the coalition, all the nation who is the shoulder to shoulder with us uh, during this war. Number one is United States on the figures. Imagine number two is a Great Britain. And this is their great demonstration of the responsibility. This is extremely important, the uh, European Union and many others. But you should understand that this is not assistance for Ukraine. This is not a help for Ukraine. This is the investment in your own security, in providing the security for the every single British citizen throughout the world. Because without the deputinization of the world, you never can feel secure. Without the closing the sky, because from the sky, we have a, just yesterday, we have a 55 cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, including 12 in Kiev, who attack our electric power station, who attack our distribution center, water supply, because Putin afraid it to war against our armed forces, which was created by me since year 2014. And now we have a proof that this is one of the best armed forces in the world, despite of the fact that Russia spent more than 12 times more money than we Ukrainian. And with that situation, I can assure you that uh, only uh, five points can stop the war. Point number one, this is the weapon. And we are very much appreciate for the anti-aircraft and anti-missiles weapon. We need a jet fighter and many, many others. Now, we Petro Poroshenko, a... I did just want to ask you one final question today, which is in the, follow in the, in the uh, aftermath of the election of Lula da Silva in Brazil, this is someone who has claimed that President Zelensky is as responsible as Putin was for the war. What, what's your response to Lula da Silva uh, and his equivalence between Ukraine and Russia in his comments. I know Lula da Silva. I was the minister of the foreign affairs in year 2009 when he was a guest of Ukraine here in Kiev. And uh, he is a <laughs> very charismatic person. But I want to divide what he said before the election and other, after the election. And this is just my message. First of all, I want to congratulate Lula with the victory of the, on the presidential election. And I think that now it is a very great responsibility he has on his shoulders in a reform and saving Brasilia, Brazil and in a, be the uh, influential member of the global coalition. And there is only one place in the global coalition. This is the coalition with Ukraine. And I hope, Mr. Uh, Silva, we waiting for you in this coalition. And uh, my message to him, please remember, victory of Ukraine would be victory of Europe. Victory of Europe would be victory of the world. Victory of the world definitely would be victory of Brazil. No any other way. Well, Pedro Poroshenko, thank you so much for your words. Let's hope that Lula was listening to those there. That's it for the briefing today. Join me for the next two hours as we explore more of all of these top stories really affecting our country and indeed the world. Stick with me for To The Point after this.
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and of course fun every Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should 